Uh, yeah, th- we're supposed to be praying for the election. This is going to be a big week. And um, here, if you don't know what to pray, pray that the will of God will be done on the earth. And if, 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 you, if you don't know what to pray, pray for our leaders, our, our local leaders, our, you know, uh, Mayor Linda Martin right here in, in Euless. Pray for uh, the men and women that serve in the state Senate here uh, in Austin. Uh, pray for our, our congressmen. Uh, do we have any women congressmen in Texas? Or is it all men? Uh, oh, yeah, she's trying. We'll see Tuesday. Uh, but Lord, we pray for our, our congressmen and women, and then, of course, for our, our two senators and our governor, and then we turn our hearts to the nation. Here's the deal. You're instructed biblically to pray for your government leaders, whether you agree with them or not. You know that? Like, if your team doesn't win on Tuesday, you're still supposed to pray for the, 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 the president. Whether you like him or not, or you agree with him or not, we're instructed by God. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, it says, I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. So here's the instruction. Just pray for everybody. And what's our prayer? Pray that God would help them. Intercede on their behalf. Give thanks to God for them. But then look at him. He, he really doubles down in verse 2. Pray the same way for kings and all in authority. A king would be a modern-day president or prime minister. Pray for king, and President Trump would love to be king of America if he could. Um, pray for kings and all who are in authority. Why? So that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by what? Godliness and dignity. This is good and pleases God our Savior. And he wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. So yes, we pray for the president, even if you don't agree with them. We pray for all of our leaders. You know what? You should especially pray for leaders that don't agree with biblical values because they need it more than the ones that do. So you're like, well, I just, you know, if you're visiting our church, we are very pro-life. We are very anti-abortion, but that doesn't mean we endorse any particular candidate. There are usually one candidate or another that is pro-life, but so it might seem like we're trying to pick an election every four years. We're not. We simply, until abortion is illegal in this country, we will always vote for the candidates that most likely align with life in the womb. So can I just talk about that for a minute when I'm not streaming on television? We used to play worship music over my wife's belly. Did y'all do that? Did, dads, did you ever talk to your, your baby and when they were on the other? They're only this far apart from you. That baby is alive. See what I'm saying? They need to be protected because they can't defend themselves. So pray for the government leaders that disagree with your biblical view because they need it all the more. In fact, did you notice in that scripture it said we should intercede on their behalf? If you're new to Jesus stuff, the word intercede, basically think of it as a lawyer. Let's say you get caught in a big old speeding ticket or something or, you know, whatever, and uh, you you have to go to the court and you have to hire a lawyer because this thing might get out of control. You're not really supposed to speak. Your lawyer will intercede on your behalf. The lawyer stands and just you shut up and sit there and they will speak for you. We have been instructed by God to intercede for our leaders, our government leaders. We have been instructed to go before them and say, listen, Senator so-and-so, Congresswoman so-and-so, President so-and-so, Lord, they don't really know biblical truth, but I do. So I intercede on their behalf. Lord, have mercy on our nation. Have mercy on our leaders. Have grace. I pray for them that you'd help them, Father. Why? So that we can live peaceful, quiet, godly lives that were marked with, do you remember what it said? Dignity. So next time you make that Facebook post, ask yourself if it's godly and dignified. Because I really don't like when Christians or people that claim to be Christians badmouth politicians and badmouth our leaders. Whether we agree with them or not, they were people that we're supposed to honor because they were created in the very image of God. They bear the image of our God. They deserve honor. They deserve respect. And when we create undignified posts, it, it, it furthers the problem in America. It creates more division. It creates more hate. It creates more fear. We are called to be peacemakers. Yeah. Well, I, I just don't know if I'm, I'm so entrenched in this thing. That's the problem. Do you know that one day you are going to judge the earth with the Lord Jesus? So, You have to have a big picture. You can't get caught in the minutia of every little thing you disagree with. And you can't throw a temper tantrum if your team doesn't win on Tuesday. First Corinthians, if you're like, we're going to judge the world. Have you ever read first Corinthians chapter six? It says uncommon church. Don't you realize that someday we believers are going to judge the world? And he was talking about suing. He said, Christians should never sue each other. He said, since you're going to judge the world one day, can't you decide these little things among yourselves? 
So my point is that Christians need to think from a kingdom perspective, not from an earthly perspective. We need to think big picture, not little picture. So in, if the world goes crazy on Wednesday, ask the Holy Spirit how you can bring peace, how you can bring godliness, how you can bring dignity, how you can bring calm to your world. You might not be able to calm the whole world, but you can bring calm to your world. And the, I said we get entrenched in politics. So many Christians be, at this time of year, every four years, we make politics our religion. And we, we're, we're so radical in our political hopes and our fears. We shouldn't have more hope and faith in the government than we have in Jesus. We're, we're kingdom people, not earthly people. We're a part of a government that's bigger than just America. First John chapter two says, do not love this world nor the things that the world offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the father in you. Now, let me also make a very big disclaimer. I love this country, but I am a Christian before I'm an American. My first devotion is not to the kingdom of the United States. My first and my biggest devotion is to the kingdom of heaven. But I say again, I love this nation. I have in the past, and I would still be willing today to lay my life down to protect the freedoms that this nation was created on. However, I love the kingdom of God more, and I would be more readily willing to lay my life down so that the gospel could go around the world. I know you're like, that's so crazy. That's a first service clap. You guys are cute. So second service, the whole room would be shouting and hankies waving. So come on, somebody. You got to double down and make up for the person who's not sitting next to you right now. Maybe you should invite somebody to come to church and sit with you next week. Anyway, my point is, you're like, that's so crazy to be so extreme for Jesus. Listen, I, I, I'm just extreme for the kingdom of God. Yeah. Because being a Christian does not mean that we just go, oh, look, thank you for trying. <laughs> being a Christian, <laughs> I'll say something profound. Oh, that doesn't count. And none of you guys get to start it. So, okay, Melanda gets to sit right here in the front row. <laughs> being a Christian does not mean we go to church once in a while when our kids don't have any other activities. Being a Christian is meant to be extreme. We're meant to live different than everybody else. We're meant to be different. We live in this world, but we're not from this world. We've died to this world so that we can live for another world. We have become citizens of heaven. You have a passport for whatever nation, for America, for Sweden, for South Africa, but our, our citizenship is in heaven. We still live here on the earth, but only for a few years longer. Where we're going to live forever is in heaven, and we have become citizens of that nation. So therefore, our language, we speak a different language in heaven. We speak a language of faith and hope and love and grace and honor. Our actions, our lives should not look like the earth. Everything we, should, we do should reflect heaven. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 19. Now, granted, he's talking about unbelievers, so not talking about believers, he said, unbelievers are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. And they brag about the shameful things that they do. And they think only about life where? Here on earth. We are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus lives and reigns and rules forever. And we what? What's, what do we do while we're here on the earth still? We eagerly wait for him to return as savior. We are citizens of heaven. So our first focus is up, anticipating Jesus' return. Jesus is coming back, so look busy. That was a bumper sticker in the 80s. <laughs> but our second focus is out. How many more people can I introduce to the love of God while I'm on this earth? And here's, I, I sometimes will get this, and somebody will shake my hand and go, listen here, preacher. You don't want us to be so heavenly minded. We're no earthly good. Well, the problem is Christians have become so earthly minded. We're no heavenly good. I remind you that you are a priest in full-time ministry. You, I say this all the time. You are in full-time ministry. You're like, I'm in full-time truck driving, or I'm in full-time teaching, or I'm a full-time student, or I'm a full-time mom, or I'm a full-time whatever in my office. No, that's your part-time job. You only do that 40 hours a week. You're a full-time minister of the Lord Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter two says, you people are not like that. You're a chosen people. You are royal priests. You are a holy nation. You are God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others what? The goodness of God. 
because he called you out of darkness into wonderful light. You are a chosen royal priest. All of us are a holy nation, and we have a calling on our lives to show people in darkness the great light of God's love. How many people have you called into the light recently? If calling people from darkness to light was our responsibility, was your job, how well are you doing at the job that God has given you? How many people have you called from darkness to light recently? Do you guys remember the Great Commission at the end of Jesus' ministry, Matthew chapter 28? He's about to head up into heaven. He gives one final instruction. He says, I need you guys to go into all the world and make disciples. Who are you discipling right now? Uh, nobody. Nobody. That's your job. My job is to do my job. I work for a living. I remind you to erase the line between the secular and the sacred because you are a royal priest. You are a light in the darkness. We should live differently. We are citizens of heaven. We should have a distinct heavenly difference to us. We should, I hate when Christians walk around acting like they got baptized in vinegar. We should have joy and hope and faith and light and love and blessing and honor in everything we do. How are we doing on time? Because that was only my introduction. Let me get to the main text of this message. If you're wondering how I put this message together, I just started with praying for the election and I'm like, and another thing, and another thing, and another thing. I love when I get the laugh on the return bar on a keyboard, because Tyler thinks I actually type my sermons on a typewriter. A typewriter is one of these things that we used to have in the old days. You'd slide paper in. Here's my main text. Matthew chapter six, verse 33. Seek the kingdom of God if it's convenient. Seek the kingdom. Oh, seek the kingdom of God if your kids don't have an event on Sunday morning. Seek the kingdom of God if you were at a wedding late on Saturday night and you went to bed at midnight and didn't want to get up for... Come on. Seek the kingdom of God if you're blessed financially and you got more money than month and everything. Seek the kingdom of God if you're healthy, you don't have the Rona, you don't have the arthritis. Seek the kingdom of God above everything. Seek the kingdom of God if your guy wins on Tuesday. Come on. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously, and then what's he going to do? He's going to give you everything you need. Can I put that in Brad phrase? God's kids receive as a gift what the world strives for. Don't clap too good. I stole that from another preacher. It's a half a clap. Yeah. Is that because I stole it from another preacher? God's kids receive as a gift what the world strives for. The, the, the Lord will just gift wrap it and give it to his kids. Why? Because we seek the Father's kingdom first in every area of our life. And then in return, he gives us everything we need. We don't have to strive. We don't have to manipulate. We don't have to try to build our kingdom. All we have to do is seek his kingdom and he will give what we need. What, 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 what do we do in return? We live righteous. We pray in the spirit. We love people well. We honor others. We, we bring joy into whatever room we walk into. We live holy. We give generously. We tithe. I'm just so worried that I'm going to get a better job. Seek the kingdom and a good job will be added to you. Oh, I just don't know if I'll find the right spouse. Seek the kingdom and a spouse will be added to you. Seek first the kingdom. Fix your eyes on Jesus. It, it's how you pray. It's what position you pray from that matters. Is the problem that you're praying for over you or under you? The, the perspective you have when you go to prayer is how much faith, because so many Christians beg God to do something that he wants to give them. All he's asking us to do is seek the kingdom, and then he'll give the answer to prayer. But we're over here begging for the answer when he, all he's doing is asking that we seek the kingdom. And what happens is instead of praying like a child of God, we end up praying like an orphan. Please, God, can I have some more? That's a bit from the, mu the musical Oliver. Okay, a, a musical is like a play, but they sing. It's 2020, and theaters are closed. We're not meant to beg God like orphans. We're meant to go to God's fridge and just say, God, I need a better job. God, I need a spouse. 
God, my car has so much rust on it, I'm afraid it's just gonna fall into dust. And he's like, yeah, seek my kingdom. I'll take care of the rest. Seek the kingdom. Let me give you a practical biblical example of what this looks like. Um, King Solomon, this is David's boy. King Solomon in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, he built this beautiful worship center. He built a temple where they could sacrifice, where they could worship, where the, the holy of holy, the very presence of God, instead of living on the inside of you, the very presence of God would be manifest on the earth in this temple in Jerusalem. So on the day that they cut the ribbon, on the day they're opening the temple, King Solomon was leading the people in worship. And King Solomon himself wanted to bring wanted to open the temple with an unbelievable offering. So we talk about taking the first 10% of our income and giving it to the Lord. Maybe taking a special offering for missions or to feed the poor or to do an outreach or something like that. Listen to what King Solomon did. Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse five. King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. And so the king and all the people dedicated the temple of God. That is, first of all, very messy once you cut all those animals open. Second of all, that is extremely radical giving. That the king, who was wealthy, loved the Lord so much, he wanted to give to the Lord so extravagantly, I had to turn those numbers into modern numbers. So in 2019, the average price of a cow was $1,500. So at, he sacrificed 22,000 cows that's, he gave the Lord $33 million. Sheep, in round numbers, 300 bucks a sheep, which kind of made me think, babe, I think we need a sheep in our backyard. Like, wouldn't that be cute? And then the thing would mow the grass for me? But he gave the Lord 120,000 sheep. So he gave the Lord $36 million in sheep. Solomon gave God $69 million in one church service. Lord, let that happen to Uncommon Church. <laughs> Hallelujah. And you might stand back and go, oh my gosh, I just read the numbers. I didn't think about the generosity. I didn't think about how significant that extravagant gift was for, for Solomon to give God $69 million. He was seeking the kingdom of God over building the financial kingdom of Solomon. What do you think the Lord's response was? Flip over two chapters. The Queen of Sheba comes for a visit. She's coming to see all of the wonder and the spectacle of Jerusalem and the temple that Solomon built and how he organizes and runs the city. So the Queen of Sheba is totally blown away by Solomon. So in 2 Chronicles chapter 9, she gave the king a gift of 9,000 pounds of gold and a great quantity of spices and precious jewels. Do you know what gold costs today? So if we're using the same analogy, $2,000 an ounce. There are 16 ounces in a pound. So it's $33,000 per pound in today's money. But remember, she gave the king 9,000 pounds of gold. She gave him $288 million. Solomon sought the Lord. Two chapters later, God was so blown away by Solomon's generosity that he wanted to bless him back. So he gave him four times as much as Solomon gave the Lord. Seek first the kingdom, all these things will be added back to you. Solomon blessed God so big that God was like, oh, Solomon, I love you. And then he blessed him back four times over. You can't outgive God. Let's say we were doing a big building campaign or we were doing a big outreach financial fundraiser or we've got this great idea to do a, a thing for the community and I need you to help us give. It's gonna cost $10,000. And you're like, yeah, I could give 100 bucks. I could give 200 bucks. And the Lord's like, give 500 and you're like, oh, I can't do that. You can't outgive God. Yeah. See, I remind you, seek first the kingdom and God will add all these things to you. We receive as a gift from God the same things that the world is striving for. Let me read it again. Matthew 6, 33. Put it up, fellas. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously. And then he'll give you everything you need. Live Every day, seeking the kingdom of God. And it's biblical. But here's the point. Did you notice? Guys, come put the verse back up for me. Ryan and uh, PJ, please. Um, I'm going to go out of the light. Sorry, TV, TV guys. Seek the kingdom of God, but above all else, live righteously, comma, and he'll give you everything you need. If you're truly seeking the kingdom of God, it's okay to live after the comma. 
It's okay to live after the comma. Don't just seek and give and pray without believing God that he is going to add all these things back to you. It's like a farmer putting all his seed in the ground and being like, all right, hope that becomes something. And then like going to Disney World. No, a farm, seed is expensive. A farmer's going to put seed in the ground. He's going to watch it every day. He's going to weed it. He's gonna, if it's not getting water, he's going to water it. If, if there's critters eating it, he's going to protect his investment. Christians need to learn to live after the comma. Seek the Lord. Live righteous. And then wait and look for the Lord to bless you. And some people will be like, well, you know, when they got that new job, when, 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 when they found each other at church and got married, when they had that baby, you know, when, when they were able to have that successful ministry, when they had that great you group, it was just a coincidence. There's no such thing as a coincidence for a believer. There's no such thing as a coincidence for somebody that's seeking the kingdom of God first. How do you know that? Psalm 37, 23. It is the Lord who directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every little detail of their life. There's no such thing as a coincidence for a believer because if you're a righteous person, the Lord is ordaining your steps, which means it's not a coincidence. It's God ordaining your steps. It's God setting you up for success. He's directing your steps and he delights in every little detail of your life. Oh, I got to run to the store and get some milk. The Lord is ordaining your steps to get milk. So when you walk into the grocery store, be on the lookout for where you can bring light to darkness, where you can bring the kingdom of heaven to the kingdom of this earth. Don't just get milk. Open your spirit eyes to look around. Does somebody need prayer? Do I need to pay for somebody's groceries? Do I need to encourage somebody? Do I need to pray for somebody for healing? Everywhere you go, you're a minister of the gospel. So what do we do? We seek the kingdom first. We seek God's kingdom before we try to build our kingdom. And too many Christians get this wrong. And they try to treat God like he's some sort of magical slot machine. Oh, if I just do the right thing and I pull the lever, then new car. <laughs> All cherries. Or so, I don't know. I've never played a slot machine. Is cherries good or bad? Anybody want to admit they're going to hell? No, no I'm just kidding. <laughs> Catherine, is it three cherries? That's good, right? I lost my train of thought when I made fun of Catherine. So. See, he's not just the king of kings. He should be the king of your heart. He loved me when I didn't love him. He died for me when I wouldn't even want to live for him. He opened the door to my heart and he took away all of my sin. You know that the Bible says when you repent of your sin and you ask the Lord Jesus to forgive you and to come into your heart, we just kind of picture like a blanket kind of covering our sin, but it's still there. We're still sinners. Well, the Bible says that he removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. How far is that? Pretty far. The Bible says that he takes our sinful hearts and he washes our hearts white as snow. Like before you let the dog out to pee, like white as snow. Oh, you guys live in North Texas. All right, snow is this stuff that happens in cold climates. It's like rain, but white and pure. What do we have to do? Ask for forgiveness. Repent. Repentance means you turn 180 degrees away from your sin. Repentance means you don't still look at porn, you don't still get high, you don't still get drunk, you don't still lie to your boss, you don't sleep with somebody you're not married to. Repent means you stop doing the things you used to do, and what did we say? Seek first the kingdom, live righteous, or die trying. Well, I was trying, but I blew it. Well, get back to trying. And then you're gonna receive the gift of eternal life. Hop up on your feet. See, what happens is when we give our hearts to Jesus, God is not in some distant cosmic atmosphere. The Bible says he comes and he lives in our heart. That if we open the door, he comes in and lives in our heart. And he, he brings with him the power of heaven. It's like having Tony Stark's arc reactor on the inside of you. You have a nuclear power source living on the inside of you. You should always be equipped to worship, to pray, to encourage, to build up, to give, to be a light in the darkness. But speaking of that, here's a thought I had. Okay, it's a thought I stole from another preacher. There's a good expression. 
Hey, did you go to Wednesday night prayer last week? It was powerful. We had a download from heaven. Or hey, I'm, I'm looking, the doctor said, you know, I've got this cancer, I've got this tumor, I've got this cyst, I've got this arthritis, I've got this thing, but I'm, I'm believing God for a download from heaven, amen, praise hallelujah. We just need to connect with God and receive faith and receive joy and receive a prophetic word. It's a good expression. We want to receive a download from heaven. Let me give you a better expression. You don't need a download from heaven. You need a live stream from heaven 24 seven because you have a modem connected to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords living in the, on, on the inside of you on earth as it is in heaven. That's not coming down. That's coming out of you. I should do this for a living. That was good. That would have been a good time to clap. How does it start? Like, let's say you're visiting this morning and you're like, never heard a preacher talk like that. Never heard a preacher beg for applause and a message. <laughs> Stick around, I'll beg for laughs too. How do I get started in this crazy Jesus journey? It's easy, just die. Not literally, easy. Die to yourself. Die to building your kingdom. Die to the sins that you want to commit so that you can live for something so much greater. Seek his kingdom, not yours. I said it already, you have to repent of your sin. Turn 180 degrees away from sin. Ask the Lord to forgive you. And the Bible says he will. He'll give you the gift of eternal life. He'll put his power and love and grace and kingdom on the inside of you. That's how it starts. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that you'd help us to seek your kingdom more than anything else. As we elect a leader of the kingdom of America, whether it's President Trump or Vice President Biden, we pray for your kingdom to come and your will to be done. But even before we seek what's best for our kingdom of America, God, we seek your kingdom for America. We, we, we seek your face, we seek your presence, we seek righteousness and holiness and godliness and dignity and that we would be peacemakers this week in everything we do. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I wanna pray for and talk to people that might be on the outside looking in. And you're like, I don't know that I'm right with God today. I don't know that I have repented of my sin. I, I don't know that I have turned my back on building my kingdom and I'm look, seeking and living for the kingdom of God. Well, the good news is today is your day of salvation. Today is your day to repent. Today is your day to ask God to forgive you. Today is your day to begin your first steps in eternal life. So if you're here this morning and you're not right with the Lord, you have not made Jesus the Lord of your life. You have not repented of your sin. You have not asked him to forgive you or it's been a long time. Your heart has grown cold. You've wandered away from the things of God. You've turned your heart back over to some sinful things in your life. You used to know the Lord, but it's been a while. Whether it's your first time or the first time in a long time, I'd like to pray for you. I'd like to lead you in a prayer of repentance. I'd like to lead you in a prayer of seeking first the kingdom of God for the rest of your life. The choice is yours. I can't make it for you, but I can help you. So if you're here this morning, nobody's looking around but me, and you need to pray that prayer to repent of sin, to make Jesus the Lord of your life for the first time or the first time in a long time. Would you shoot your hand up real high and just wave it at me and say, preacher, pray for me. I gotta get right with God today. I see your hands, I see your hands. Is there anybody else? I see two hands up. Come on, somebody. Good. I see three hands. Come on, somebody. Good. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hey, for the sake of the three, can we all pray this out loud? If you believe it in your heart, pray it out loud with your mouth. Say, dear Jesus, I repent of my sin. Forgive me. Wash me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Help me, Lord to seek your kingdom. So be the king of my heart, the king of my life. And that help me, Lord, to seek your kingdom first. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me, for forgiving me. I receive the gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name. What do you say, church? Amen. Hey, for you three, I'm so proud of you. 
I'm so proud of you. Come on, somebody. Holly, I love what we do here.